see you this weekend. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, over to Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, want to welcome our online campus. Glad you're with us down in Australia, New Zealand, out at Etiwana Gardens in Rancho, over at Lone Hill. Fireside room, anybody over there? Make some noise. <laughs> wow, that's the most noise I've ever heard from you guys on, a, on the third service. Great job, man. Proud of you guys. All right, as you're turning to Luke chapter 10, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're going to get to that. I want to ask you a question, just kind of set the stage here. I've made this statement before, and I want you to tell me if you agree with it. I've said this, everybody's normal until you get to know them. <laughs> Have you heard me say that? Do you think that's true? Yeah. Uh, do you find that your biggest struggle in life is with other people? I mean, it's okay. Hey, think about it. If... if, if uh, if you were the only person on the planet, you'd have a lot less problems, wouldn't you? Now, you'd have other problems, but isn't it true, if, just being honest here, that the biggest challenge of our life is getting along with each other? I mean, most of your work problems and school problems is people that you wish existed someplace else. <laughs> Come on, even in your families, family, I mean, it's okay to say this. I mean, you, you know, my biggest challenge in ministry is you. And that's okay because some of your biggest struggle in your life is me. It's, it's just life. I'm, I'm saying, let's be honest with each other. We, we, listen, people, people can be difficult, can't they? Family members, people in the community. Uh, as a pastor, it is my job, my calling, to meet your needs as, as best I can, either individually or through one of the ministries that we have here. When you decide you're going to be part of CCV, Things that keep me up at night is making sure that all your needs are met. If it's counseling, if it's an addiction that you have, if it's um, marriage uh, relationships, if it's singleness, my job is to bring the Word of God into that and encourage you and tell you there is a way that, that you can have the abundant life. There's a way. And uh, it's a challenge sometimes because people are different and one size does not fit all. And... Uh, even here at our church, we have to decide. We, you know, I feel it is our calling, and this is what I've, what I've spent most of my life doing. When you come to a weekend service, I want to connect with the seeker while growing the believer. That's the term I use all the time. I want to, in other words, there are people who come in here every weekend who are just checking out spirituality or checking out Christians or Christ. So I want to connect with them while at the same time, teaching the Word of God, because it's ultimately the Word of God that will not return void. So we're not going to get shallow in our preaching and our worship, but we are going to do things that will connect with somebody who's new. That's why sometimes when you come in, you might hear Coldplay playing in the speakers. Uh, why, why would you do that? Well, because it's the first time in church, you're a little nervous, not knowing what to expect. And if you hear that, well, wait a minute, maybe these people are okay. I mean, I mean, Coldplay's great. So they're obviously good people. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just little things like that. But there are some things that are non-negotiables. Some things you can't, uh, they're, they're what we call essentials. They're intrinsic essentials, meaning that there's something that's happened in us as Christ followers that's supposed to express itself outwardly. When we come to this parable uh, of the Good Samaritan, the setting is a lawyer has come to Jesus to trick him. <laughs> and God is calling us right now, he, <laughs> affirming. He wants to get Jesus to say something negative about the law so that the lawyer then can say, ha you're not one of us. You're not one of us. You don't respect, you don't hold the law in high regard. So you're, you're a false teacher because they've continued to get a sneaky suspicion that Jesus doesn't value the law like they do. Because in Jesus' day, people valued the law like this. I'm going to memorize it, and I'm going to do it. And if I keep doing it, I'm going to tip the scales in my favor. And if I get more good than bad, then God has to receive and accept me. So you had lawyers who would memorize the 638 precepts. I mean, there were laws about everything, folks. How to go on a date, how to have a relationship, Laws, ceremonial cleansing laws, how to walk and live in the tabernacle, how to offer sacrifice, how to operate business, how to uh, operate your other relationships outside of marriage. I mean, it, it goes on and on. I mean, little what you could and could not do on the Sabbath, how much you could carry, how much you could not carry, what work you could do, what is work, what is not work. Rings and rings of paper. And so these lawyer types 
And many religious people, they felt that if I could just be more good than bad, I could tip the scales in my favor and finally, ultimately, get into the kingdom of God. Now, when you hold that as your premise, you know that you're really not guaranteed to get into the kingdom until old age because it's going to take you a lifetime before you can tip the scales, right? But they keep hearing Jesus when he teaches say things like this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for it is near. You can get in now. And so they're assuming that if Jesus thinks you can get in now, he doesn't hold that law in high regard because obviously you don't have to keep the law. You don't have to tip it in your scales. There's another way. So he wants to trick Jesus to say something negative about the law. Then he's going to go tell all his law, your friends. And he asked Jesus a simple question in the context of this parable. He says, Jesus, what do I need to do to get to heaven? He expects Jesus to say something like, well, just follow me. Just listen to what I say. Walk in the dust of the rabbi. You're in. And then he's going to say, aha, you don't hold the law in high regard. You're a false teacher. We shouldn't listen to you. But Jesus is brilliant. Jesus always answers a question with another question. Right? And he says, well, you want to know how you get into the kingdom? Let me ask you, what does the law say? How do you read it? He's saying, okay, you tell me. What does the law tell you concerning how to get in the kingdom of heaven? Now, you've got one of two ways to answer that question. As a lawyer, he'd be pretty sharp. One, you could list all 638 precepts. (laughs) Well, let me tell you what it says. Don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this. And it'd take forever. Or you could just give the 40,000-foot view. You could talk about the spirit of the law. What, What is the righteousness behind the law? What is the law really after? And the lawyer chooses option two and does it quite well. Because he says in response to Jesus' question, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus answers and says this, you've spoken rightly, you've done well. And then he adds this, do this and you will live. Now why does he say that? Because that should have grabbed the lawyer's attention that even though you know the law and the spirit of the law, you don't do either one. So how can it save you? See, Jesus is saying, I know that you're here because you think I don't hold the law in higher regard. I'm telling you that I hold the law in a higher regard than you do, because you're so busy down in the weeds trying to keep one after the other that you don't know the spirit of the law. And even if you, don't know, if you do know the spirit of the law, which you've obviously confessed that you do, you don't keep it. What do you mean? All right, who does? Do you? Oh, I didn't ask you if you wanted to. I said, do you? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? I mean, all the time? No. You might have good seasons, maybe even a good 30 minutes. But who of us in the room pursues God more than anything else? All the time. Well, I don't. Pastor, no. (laughs) Say it isn't so. I mean, come on. I have good times, good seasons, good days. Who, Who pursues God above and beyond everything else all the time? Come on. All right. What is the real truth about us? We pursue God most passionately when we want to get God involved in giving us something we really want, the thing we really worship and pursue. That's how most of us operate with God. Come on, just be honest. Just be transparent. You want me to be? I want you to be. We, we, we do love God. We do. We appreciate God. But does he govern every attitude and every decision you make 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No. No. We might even wish that he did, and we'd like to try harder. But the reality is we don't. Jesus is trying to get this lawyer to admit, even if you know the spirit of the law, you don't keep it. And what about loving your neighbor as yourself? Oh, oh yeah, right. I mean, come on. How many of you unfriend a friend on Facebook when they keep celebrating something good that's happening and you're just tired of hearing about it? Boom, unfriend. How many of you do that? Come on. We're supposed to rejoice when something good happens to somebody. We're not supposed to covet. We're not supposed to envy. Who does that all the time? I mean, you may have seasons where, yeah, congratulations, but down deep in your side, I mean, think about it. Think about it. Great job, but down deep inside, you're thinking, God, get him. (laughs) Come on. You know, why, why can't my life turn out this way? Why can't good things happen to me? Why you? Why you? I mean, you're no better than me. Come on. We are covetous. We're envious. We're jealous. Now, we do have good times when we say, hey, I'm genuinely glad about what's happened to you. But most of the time, we wish it happened to us. Most of us spend our lives looking two rungs up the ladder, wishing we could climb to where people are rather than looking two rungs down, helping people get up to where we are. The best definition I ever heard of loving your neighbor as yourself goes like this. 
To love your neighbor as yourself is to serve him with the grace and kindness and eagerness with which you serve yourself and meet the person's needs with all the power and passion you meet your own needs. That means you care just as much about your neighbor's success as you do your own. You care just about your neighbor's children as you do your own. This means forget about trying to keep up with the Joneses. Help the Joneses get to where you are. Who does that? I mean, come on. Who does that? You might have seasons again when you, you know, I love my neighbors, Jeff, I really do. But your whole life can be defined that way? See, what is Jesus hoping? Jesus is hoping the lawyer will hear this and think, well, if, if, if that's what I got to do to be saved, man, I'm, I forget it. I can't, I can't do it all the time. Jesus, how can you expect that of me? I can't do this all the time. He doesn't realize Jesus doesn't expect that of him, that he expects it of himself. Because the law is both his security and his killer. If you try to reach God by keeping the set of laws, rules, and regulations, then what you're doing is you're, you're taking control of your own salvation. And that gives you a false sense of security. Because you never stop to think that in reality you don't even keep the law that you think is sacred. You violate your own moral code almost every day. And in hopes, Jesus wanted the lawyer to say, now what, how should the lawyer have responded? He should have said, Jesus, man, I... I mean, now that I think about it and really rationalize my way through this, I do know the law. I can't keep it perfectly. What would Jesus have said? I know. The law was never meant to save you. It was just to show you, like a mirror, that your face is dirty and that you need the mercy and grace of God. And then Jesus would have been able to say, and God has given the riches of his mercy through the life and death of his son. And all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then that great verse in Romans 1 where the apostle Paul says, we are saved by righteousness, but it's not your righteousness. It's a righteousness that comes from God. Do you know, do you know what that means? It means that Jesus, remember there are two ways to be righteous. Keep the law perfectly or pay the penalty for breaking it. You and I have broken it. Jesus paid our penalty on the cross, past, present, future sins. So the death Jesus died for our sins, God credited it to your account. So that when he sees you, he actually sees you as righteous, right under the law. Now pragmatically, you may not be righteous, but judicially, Legally, God sees you as having met the requirements of the law through Christ. Therefore, he sees you as one of his. Now, if the lawyer would just admitted that, things would have been good. But if you look at the text, I think it's, it's in verse 29. The Bible says the lawyer wanted to justify himself. So he asked a question. He wants to get into semantics with Jesus. He says, well, it depends what you mean by the word is. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he actually said, what do you mean by neighbor? I mean, who's really my neighbor? Now, why is he struggling with this? Because, again, the law is his identity. You know, remember what Abdul Murray said? That it's not uh, that there's a, a lack of evidence for the reason someone rejects Jesus. It's that to receive the message Jesus gives is hard because it means that some things would have to change. And if our security and our, our significance is built on the past, now, now stay with me. In other words, sometimes to, for you to receive Christ would have to be to admit your parents were wrong. Wow. That's just too hard for some people. To receive Jesus and grace would mean that your tradition, your religious tradition, might have been erroneous, that you really are saved by grace, not by works. And that would be to admit that everything before this point in your life was an error. And, and that's just too hard. It might mean that You've got to go to your parents or even your wife or even your husband and say, I've got to tell you, I found Jesus. I found a Savior. And then you're just worried about what that's going to change and how that's going to look. And that's what happened to this lawyer. But I've memorized the law. I've put so much time and effort into it. I mean, doesn't it count for something? So he wants to change the subject. And he says, by the way, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And here's what he's asking and why this parable is so important. He's basically asking Jesus this. Okay, I've asked you how to get into the kingdom of heaven. You've told me to love God and love my neighbor. Well, 
I feel like I've been loving God by memorizing his law. But what about the neighbor thing? What is the righteousness that proves I'm in the kingdom? What does it look like? That's what he's asking. In other words, what, what would be evident in my life to prove that I'm the genuine, authentic deal and I'm, I'm on my way to heaven? And Jesus, in that context, tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And if you look at the story of the Good Samaritan, he, the Samaritan finds this guy in a ditch and he meets all of his needs, all of them. Think about how it's written. He even meets his transportation need. He puts him on a donkey and takes him to the inn. He protects him from future robbers. If he continues to lie there, people are just going to continue to rob and continue to wound. But he picks him up. He carries him. He, 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 he meets his need for shelter. He gives him water to drink and food. And then he tells the innkeeper, here's two denarii. Give him whatever he needs. Meet all his needs, and I'll pay the rest when I come tomorrow. And the reason that's important is because when Jesus is defining the kind of life his followers will lead, he brings up compassion and social work. And here's the problem. Most Christ followers believe that while it is good and nice to take care of people in need, it's really optional. Most Christ followers believe, yeah, we should go to church, we should sing songs, we should study the Word, but, you know, compassion and mercy, that's really an optional thing. It's not something you really have to do for the kingdom. It's optional. And so Jesus in Matthew 25 says that at the end of time, there's going to be a huge crowd before him, and they're going to be, everybody's going to be claiming, yeah, man, we're, we were on your side all along. And he's going to say, there's a little test I'm going to do. It's a metaphor, I know, but it's to help us, not to help him. He said, there's a little test. I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. And the test is a simple one. The ones who really got the gospel... Now, let's see what he means by that. The ones who really understood that they were in a ditch, they were lost and alone, they didn't pull themselves up by the bootstraps and become righteous, they weren't even trying, while they were still sinners, while they were still ungrateful, I reached down and pulled them out by grace. The people who really understand the gospel are going to be the same people who reach down into the ditch and pull people out, even people who they don't think is, are deserving, even people who they think got themselves in that position and they should stay. They're not going to deal with those issues. They're just going to pull them out because Christ pulled them out while they were still sinners. They're going to pull them out while they're still sinners. And he said, I'll know them because they gave me water to drink and they put clothing on me and they visited me when I was in prison and they came to pour oil on me when I was sick for healing. And that's how I'll know. I'll know the difference between the two because one will have pity, but the other will have mercy. The difference between the two is pity is when you say, I feel sorry for somebody. Mercy is when I feel sorry for them. I'm going to do something about it. My hands are going to get dirty, and I'm going to pull them out of the ditch. And so when you realize the hopeless case you were, you're going to begin looking at those who seem hopeless to you with new eyes because love expresses itself through deeds and not just sentiment. Love expresses itself through deeds. Can we say that together on the count of three? One, two, three. Love expresses itself through deeds and not just sentiment. One more time. Love expresses itself through deeds and not just sentiment. And in 1 John 3, the apostle says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. And then finally, stay with me and then I'll go around third and head home. Finally, when he says, Jesus, who's my neighbor? He's trying to get Jesus to whittle it down. He's trying to say, Jesus, okay, all right, I got it. I got to be last to my neighbor, but surely you don't mean the Romans. And Jesus goes right past the Romans into the worst people that Jews believe existed on planet Earth, the very bottom of the spiritual barrel, the Samaritans. The Samaritans is the good guy in the parable. you got to understand, Jews despised Samaritans. Uh, like, kind of like Dodger fans despise Giants fans. You know, or like, uh, let's say, like St. Louis people, especially Rams fans, despise Los Angeles. Okay? Or for some of you who may get this, some of you won't, like, a, like Blake Griffin despises trainers. Some of you will get that. Some of you. But 
So, as a matter of fact, in John chapter 8, they're so angry with Jesus, they actually call him a Samaritan. That's the worst name they could think. You, you, you Samaritan, they call Jesus. Jesus' point in the parable, you want to know who your neighbor is? It's anybody God brings across your path that is in need. That's your neighbor. Now, some of you think this sermon is going to go one way, and I think it'll surprise you when it ends another. The purpose of this weekend is to thank you. I'm not asking for anything. I just want to thank you. you I am so proud of you. We have brought vision after vision to you, and every time we brought it to you, you fulfilled it. And I just want you to know that because that you are these, because you are, so many of you are this kind of person, and you get it, I just want to tell you a few things before I let you go, okay? Can you give me just about five to eight minutes? Just five, please, and then I'll get you to Applebee's on time, all right? Listen, listen, Zimbabwe. I ask you to help me save those villages because Mugabe had depleted the country and young kids were starving. We went into those three villages and we had a vision of one village at a time. And you did it. We dug numerous wells, I think 15 plus wells. We repaired dilapidated schools so the kids could have education. I ask you to give for a medical clinic, you did, and we built medical clinics. I ask you to give to build churches, and you did, and we can build a church in Zimbabwe villages for $15,000. Man, I wish we could do that here. Now people have access to medical care, clean water. We've developed chicken farms where we buy chickens and start the farms, and then they can irrigate their own land because they're resilient. And now there are four villages with hundreds and hundreds of kids that you saved their lives, and you're giving them an education, and they will be able to escape poverty. You did that because we came to you and we asked you and you continued to give faithfully week after week after week. And now I just want you to know that because of you, children will not die of starvation in these villages. And our vision is one village at a time until we cross Zimbabwe. Mothers and fathers will not die of diseases that are preventable and curable. And kids will have a quality education that will help them escape the poverty level of the village and be introduced to Jesus and a plan for their lives. But the thing is, it, I don't think it's wise to go and do things over there if we're not first willing to do things in our own backyard. And that's why, again, thank you for helping me develop the program Kaleidoscope. I asked you six years ago to do it, and you did. Do you realize that we are in schools all over this valley now with mentoring, coaching, tutoring programs? Do you know that 75% of elementary students in our valley are at risk of not completing high school? and continuing the cycle of poverty. But we also know that with a mentor or academic program, which is what Kaleidoscope is, that at-risk students are 50% more likely to graduate high school and enroll in college. Did you know that a teacher in Covina spends her time with 24 students until they get to fourth and fifth grade, then it's 30 students per teacher. That's overwhelming. And that half the students of Covina, half the students of Covina, do not meet literacy or English language art standards. And 71% of Covina students do not meet mathematics standards. This is happening in our valley on our watch. But with our program Kaleidoscope, we now know that students are 50% more likely to graduate high school, go to college, and break the poverty cycle if they have a mentor, a coach, and a tutor after school. Do you realize what this do you realize that in one generation we can break this? And we're doing it. We're on our way. People like little Joel has a hope and a future because of you. Little Bianca, who was living in a shelter, struggling to complete assignments, overwhelmed by poverty, found new life in a relationship with a tutor, and is not merely surviving, but is thriving now. And she recently won an award for her reading achievements. So she goes from Hungry, and when you're hungry, nothing else matters. You can't study when you're hungry, man. She goes from being hungry to studying to excelling. Thank you. Great job with Kaleidoscope, man. We just hope this keeps going, going, going. And then look, look at what you've done in Nairobi, Kenya. Do you realize that we are working in the most difficult slum, probably not only in Nairobi, but of all of Africa? 90% of the children in this slum, 90%, will not graduate from eighth grade. They won't make it that far. Do you know why? Because 
the life expectancy is so short, they will become the sole provider of the family by the time they reach 14 years of age. But CCP, Chosen Children of Promise, that you have funded has gone in there. We are in 202 households, 915 children that we're given an education to, that we're making sure it stays right through high school and enrolling them in college to make sure that they can have a hope and a future and escape the poverty cycle. Great job, man. Think of all the kids. If we do this another 10 years, which we are, man, who knows? We're, we're almost reaching 1,000 kids. And what will happen in 10 years? Think about what could happen in a slum area in 10 years if it continues to go like it has now just by process of numbers because those kids will come back and rescue their parents because they've gotten an education. They'll get them out of the slums. There'll be no slums. Oh, there'll still be slums in the world but not here on our watch. And what about Kigali, Rwanda? You first sent me to preach in the prisons after the genocide. But over time, I met Anastas Sabamonka, and now we support Anastas because he's the father of a nation. The pastors of Rwanda come to him for leadership and guidance. And a businessman in our church heard me talk about this one day. I talked about, man, wouldn't it be great if these pastors who live hand, who live hand to mouth could have access to just materials, reading materials, books, and things that would educate them and encourage them to go out and continue to preach the gospel and to serve the nation of Rwanda. He heard me say that, and he couldn't get out of his head. He wanted an internet cafe for these pastors to be able to come to, to have access to the world. Internet's available in Africa. It's just so expensive. Nobody can afford it. Rich get richer, poor get poor. And he said, we're going to change that. And now these pastors can come to an internet cafe, get a free cup of coffee, and if they're, if they're having trouble sleeping, they can download a Jeff Vine sermon. Put them right out. <laughs> they can read John MacArthur. They can read Charles Swindoll, Andy Stanley. They can go on and read and learn access to the world. And what about Demo India? I, I shared the vision about four years ago that there were 72 pastors, about 72 to 75 pastors in Demo. We send up on the border of Darjeeling. It's on the northeast border of... Uh, India. I don't know if you can see it there. I, st I still don't think we have the right map here, but that's okay. Trust me, it's there. And it's right on the border where they have access to five unreached people groups. Nations. Pakistan. And so here's what you do. I ask you, given the fact that these pastors are going to go up and many of them aren't going to come back, they're going to give their lives for the gospel. I ask you at least help me to feed them and clothe them and educate them at the Bible college while they're there. And you did. And every year, we graduate 72 to 75 pastors. And then Ajay releases them up into Darjeeling. I've got another friend who said, Jeff, why are they dying? Why are they, what's the problem? Can't we make a way for them to be able to communicate back in Demo so that they would know the persecution is coming? And he's thinking, he's losing sleep right now. He's trying to think of a way to break down the communication barrier, to somehow get high-powered walkie-talkies or something where they could communicate. And who knows where that's going to go. It's not only that, but now, because people know of the hospital and orphanage that exist in Demo that you help build. I mean, and when I say help, I mean basically you build it yourself. But other people did help. But you, we, and we're not talking about $1,000. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars that we've given in both ministries. That families will come to Ajay and sell their little girls for a bowl of rice. And instead of selling them into the sex trade, Ajay, please sell them here. And then he takes them. And because of your support, educates them, clothes them, restores them, and raises up little Christ followers. So that when they get older, they're spreading the good news of the gospel and the love and compassion they found in Christ. Can I just say to you, great job. I'm so proud of you. You never once, you never once balked. Every, time I've, every single time I've asked you to do something, you've done it. And you've done it with vigor. And I'm grateful. I can tell you that I've been a senior pastor of other churches. But I've never been so proud and so at peace to be here. This is making a difference in the world, folks. Bumper back. Now, i got to say this because my wife leads this ministry, and i got to go home this afternoon. 
At the end of every month, we ask you to put the groceries behind your car, and then we have a whole team of volunteers that feed hungry people. Do some people take advantage of it? Yes. But are some people in genuine need? Absolutely. Absolutely. And people like Pete Kelly and Michael Colasano and Robin Vines lead and head this ministry, and it wasn't enough that they feed hundreds on our campus. Now they've partnered with God's Pantry over in Azusa. And now we're partnering with other churches to feed hundreds and hundreds of people on the second Saturday of every month. Because there are people who just need a good cooked meal to survive. And then there's bread runners. And if you, you don't know what it means to a, a, a family who's struggling financially. They've both lost their jobs. They're trying to keep their head above water and feed the kids. And up at their door shows up somebody from CCV from bread runners with a home cooked meal and say, here, man, we just want to bless you. And sometimes day after day after day after day. We got a note from Helen. She says, through the love and kindness and support of the ministry of bread runners, my parents were moved and deeply touched by followers of Jesus at Christ Church of the Valley. Not only are they believers now, but they were baptized two weeks ago at my mom's nursing home. One of her friends from the home was invited to witness her baptism ceremony. It motivated her so much that she too wanted to follow her as a baptized Christian. We all went to the ceremony. It was so magical and joyous to see how God put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Praise God, if it wasn't for CCV Bread Runners Ministry, I don't know how much longer I would have had to wait for my parents to finally see the love of Christ. CCV, thank you. Forever in Christ, Helen. Every Thanksgiving, thousands of people. My favorite event every year is the toy store when I see those kids come in and get their free presents. These are at-risk children whose name we get from the local school district, so we know these are genuine need and genuine need of help. And every time I ask you, every time I ask you, go above and beyond by supplying toys. One dude this year went out and bought 100 bicycles. 100 bicycles. Great job. I don't know if you know Tammy Craig. She's a machine, man. She takes kids in a ministry called Ripple Ministry. And she takes kids, and these kids learn to serve in their community. Kids serving kids. And her, they've done 140 outreach events. And her whole thing is, I'm going to train kids up right now to serve. So that when they get older, they'll know that a natural part of a Christ follower is this. Now, let me end this. I want to say this very carefully because I, I'm terrified of being misunderstood. Even if your political position is that we should close the borders, okay? And this election, you vote for somebody that's going to erect a wall. I'm just, this is theory. Even if that's your political uh, uh, position, which is, that's, that's your political and God-given right, it doesn't change the fact that when you meet somebody who's hungry and thirsty and in need, that as a Christ follower, you show compassion and meet that need. No matter what your political position is, it doesn't change your Christ-given responsibility to help anyone, anywhere, anytime who's in need of food and shelter and clothing and water. You say, well, people take advantage. Yes, they do. That's why I don't ever give cash. I don't give cash. I give food, water, clothing. Well, that takes more time. It's easier just, well, that's your own problem. I can understand your concern. I don't want to be taken advantage of. You took advantage of God. He still came down. You be careful. This is the call. That Jesus said, you want to know? The person, this is not work salvation. It's that the person who genuinely gets the gospel will have no trouble showing compassion to people they think don't deserve it. Because that's what Jesus did for you. Robert Murray McShane wrote this years ago. I'm not sure of the context, but I can tell you it's applicable. Dear Christians, some of you pray night and day to be branches of the true vine. You pray to be made in the image of Christ, and if so, you must be like him in your giving. Though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor. Objection. My money is my own. Answer. Christ could have said, my blood is my own and my life is my own. And had he said that, where would you and I be? Objection. The poor are undeserving. Christ might have said, they are unworthy. Wicked rebels, should I lay down my life for them? 
I will give to the good angels and deserving poor. But no, he didn't say that. He left the 99 and came after the one. He gave his blood for the un, 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 undeserving. Objection. Well, if I give my charity, the poor may abuse it. Answer. Christ might have said the same thing, yea, with far greater truth. Christ knew that thousands would trample on his blood under their feet, that most would despise it, that many would get an excuse for sinning more. But he still gave his own blood. My dear Christian friends, if you would be like Christ, give much, give often, give freely to the vile and the poor, the thankless and the undeserving. For that's what you once were. Jesus was glorious and happy, and so will you be. It is truly more blessed to give than receive. Julian, the Roman emperor, said, Nothing has contributed to the progress of the Christians than their charity to strangers. And then he finished by saying, and this is a Roman emperor now who was not a Christ follower. He said, Jews take care of the Jewish poor. Greeks take care of the Greek poor. Romans take care of the Roman poor. But you Christians, they are unbelievable. They take care of everybody's poor. They are promiscuous with their generosity. You know what keeps me up at night? This question. If CCB suddenly disappeared, would they miss us? Would they say, oh man, where did that church go? Man, they were helping our at-risk kids. They were feeding the hungry. They were helping us meet the social problem. They were real Christ followers. Where did they go? Or would they say, those bunch of bigots, self-righteous people, I'm glad they're gone. Now, some people would say that no matter what you do. I get that. I get that. Good job. Because of you, the snowball effect is in place. Okay? I'm 51 years old. I've been here seven years. I got a good 10 left in me at least, right? <laughs> man. Now, you, that hurt, man, because I'm going to go home tonight. I'm going to go home this afternoon and think, man, these people want to get rid of me. <laughs> so the snowball effect is going, but you know how a snowball is. At first, it just gathers, gathers, and then it's out of control. It's unstoppable. And if you will keep doing what you've been doing in our generation before you and I die, I think that CCV is going to have that reputation and there are going to be many people who would be sad if we went missing.